God is an awesome, awesome God, and I'm glad that he is my God, and I know that you are glad that he's your God. I want to begin by just um, expressing both my uh, gratitude and my appreciation for the opportunity to share in, in presenting these series of lessons. Um, just before we get to our purpose and how we're going to develop um, the series, I would like to just echo the sentiment that was shared by, by Matt just a moment ago, that our, our Christian context, although for many is growing to seem to be more, uh, more stressed, we use rhetoric like people don't... Um, People don't open the Bible like they used to. People don't uh, aren't receptive like they used to be. Uh, the word of God doesn't have the effect that it used to have and things of that nature. These are some of the things that we have a tendency to to volley and and um, and throw about when it comes to uh, our our state. Some of that may be that we're we're looking at our statistics. We're looking at. The church, and we're looking at, in some cases, the decline of the church. We're looking at numbers in assemblies that are declining. We're looking at congregations that are closing their doors, and we have a tendency, by nature, uh, uh, by, by by nature of who we are in American Christianity, to react to those numbers and think that there's there's something, in some way or another, wrong with the methodology and the effect of the word of God. And I, I want to just, before we even dive into this information, to remind us of a couple of things. When the church was birthed, when Christianity had its genesis, when it, when it was brought into the reality of the human fabric, it, it, was, it took place in a very pluralistic, polytheistic environment. So it, one could argue the, yeah, maybe there is some decline in the statistics, but one must in the same breath include the reality that there is nothing wrong with the gospel. If anything, God is allowing the tension of where we are and the tension of what's pressing upon us to remind us why we're here. We're not here. I know. I know it's, it's, it's America. You can have it your way. But believe it or not, you're not here for you. You're not here for luxury. You're not here for comfort. If anything, what God has allowed us to see and what he's allowing us to see is the, is the importance and the gravity of what it means to be reminded of why you believe what you believe and the fact that every time we sit on our laurels, is that the word, laurels? Is that it? Y'all ain't going to help me with nothing, huh? Yeah, yeah. We just allow ourselves to be complacent. I'll reword it. <laughs> uh, we, we allow someone to die a death of ignorance about the glory of the gospel that could be given to them when really we have a chance because there's so much confusion, so much chaos, so much ignorance that it's now time for the people of God to rise up like never before and be who Jesus called us to be. To be salt and be light, to be the answer to a world that's in desperate need. Questions are not a, a sign that we need to retreat. Questions are a sign that we ought to charge. Where there are questions, God's people are called to give an answer. So I'm excited. I'm excited about where we're going to go in our time together. I'm excited about the, the subject matter. This is the title that we've been given, and, and it's been given that way because we will, in fact, challenge you and charge you to be invested in doing some work to grow in your ability to argue the case for God, argue the case for King Jesus, argue the case for the Bible as the word of God, and why Christianity is in fact the greatest thing that a person could be. Not, not something you ought to be or something you should be. It is the greatest thing that a person could be. Say amen when you can. Oh, that was weak. What a mercy. Uh, Say amen when you can. Amen. Yeah, that's better. Let me, let me do this right quick so I can dive into the lesson. I'm, I'm going to give you a real quick annotated bib of sorts. There are a number of resources that are, are going to be uh, offered to you. In fact, 
I, I want to recommend that, that you, you take some time and, and peruse the table of contents. And for those of you that, that really want to uh, invest in your development, I want to challenge you to get these books. These two right here that I'm going to show, these three, as a matter of fact, all together were all in some way or another influenced by a thinker by the name of Gabby, Gary Habermas. Gary Habermas is the leading thinker on the subject of, on the arena of the discipline of the resurrection of Christ Jesus. And so what you find with these two in particular, with the historical Jesus and the case for the resurrection of Jesus, are two books that are aimed at helping you and I to appreciate the most legitimate history around the study of the, the, the life, the death, the, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. So I highly recommend uh, any of the ones that have Habermas's name on it, but the historical Jesus is as, is as stated. It gives the ancient evidence around the life of Jesus, but more importantly, chasing down the notion of what the plausibility of him not rising would be. In like fashion, he's done a work, a collaborative work with Michael Lacona. Michael Lacona pretty much has taken the baton from Habermas. He was a student and is a student of Habermas. In fact, he worked with him significantly in both the, uh, the, uh, the pre presentation and defense of his dis dissertation and stands right alongside of Habermas as a leading thinker in the study of the historicity and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Again, these two books are absolutely phenomenal. In, in this book, it seems a little bit of the same. Some of the information is there, but he does also in, in the, uh, the, the Risen Jesus and Future Hope, he does quite a bit of work in arguing or putting forth the gravity of and the reality of miracles. And so you have, in addition to his great work on history in those two books, an added caveat of him making a case for the plausibility of miracles. He borrows from Plantiga. He also borrows from a, from a thinker named Craig Keener. And Keener has done some studies in NDEs, near-death experiences, and brought all of that to the table to argue the question of whether or not miracles are plausible. Now, watch the impetus of this. If miracles are plausible, it points back to the reality of a God. And these are natural. This is evidence looked at from a natural paradigm to point us back to the reality that it's grounded in nothing other than God. There is no answer in our natural reality to argue the case for something that supernaturally takes place. So if you can't find it in nature, the only plausible thing is the supernatural agent. And rather than call it a force, we call him a person, and that person is God. I know that this is an apologetics le lecture, but you can say amen every now and then, <laughs> especially when you talk about God. Now, Josh McDowell, Josh McDowell, is, uh, he, he's, like, he's like Folgers Coffee or Maxwell House Coffees. Y you know, um, it's, it's good to the last drop, <laughs> but, but everybody's had it, and, and, it's, and it's reliable. You already know if you wake up at 5 o'clock, Josh will be there for you, <laughs> and, and that's the... That's, that's the strength behind this book. It is filled. It is chock full of, of information on the historicity, uh, historical arguments. He's also chased down and teased down, uh, teased out all of the different uh, miracle claims, showing how they have been how they have been articulated in prophecy past, but have been fulfilled hundreds of years later. He's done some great work statistically on showing how. Uh, those things are not likely to have taken place except there be a force behind it, an agency behind it. And some people call it a random force, but because we're Christians, we call that force who? Y'all are catching on. Amen. The Truth for You But Not True for Me by Paul Copen is a book on relativism. This book helps you and I to appreciate a proper... Um, epistemological way to think about our reality. Epistemological, big word that just, just simply means how you think. In, in relativism, you remember that the agenda of relativism, which we'll talk about next week, the agenda of relativism is to steal away the ability for us to say that there is truth. Copen has argued against, he's overcome 
some of the relativistic, some of the more popular relativistic arguments that push away and try to take away from the notion that one can stand on objective truth. He even does a little bit in helping us to appreciate how many of the claims against, uh, about relativists are self-defeating claims. And you know that just by thinking out loud. The moment you make a statement like there is no such thing as absolute truth, it ought to just register in your mind. So what you said cannot be true. Uh, you'll hear a lot more of that last week. Some of y'all just poof, right there. I saw it. <laughs> Stay with me. Um, these two books by William Lane Craig, one of them is the more more popular apologetics. And by more popular, that doesn't mean that it's less important. It just simply means it's more for the everyday reader. That's me. Uh, the everyday reader falls into the category of having information, the, the same type of information that one would use in a in a um, a legitimate uh, debate on arguing the veracity of the truth claims of Christianity can come out of this book on guard. He, he's just simply taken what he's done in an expanded form. Reasonable faith is an expanded form of him really unpacking and thoroughly going through all of the major claims for Christianity in reasonable faith. For instance, he will go through and deal with an, a, a, a standalone argument for epistemology. He'll deal with a standalone argument for cosmology, cosmological argument, the Kalam cosmological. He deals with standalone arguments for the moral argument and the like. This book is a thorough, if you are interested in a thorough explanation of each of the major arguments that can, you, can be used for apologetics, this is it. If you want that same information brought down to a, a, a place where you can grab it and use it on the run, that's where the On Guard book comes in. And for those of you that are visual learners and audio, audio, auditory learners, uh, the, the On Guard book also comes with an accompanying DVD if you're interested in that. Uh, one last book that's also very user-friendly, very readable. Um, some of the information in the book um, is, is, is very redundant. However, if you want to just take a book and, and be familiar with the push against Christianity and some good information to respond to, against Christianity. This book by Norman Geisler. Norman Geisler, as many of you know, is regarded as the pit bull of apologetics. That didn't yeah. impress none of y'all. The pit bull of apologetics. <laughs> and he's, he's partnered it, partnered up with uh, what could be called a good rock waller of apologetics. Uh, Frank Turek. Some of you have heard of Frank Turek. He's been he's been on a lot of college campuses lately. He's all over YouTube, uh, but he he has done a lot of really good work as well. But they partnered together to write this book. It's also another book that has an, a, an audio accompaniment with it, but a really good book. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. And they have gone through what they argue to be a, a, a 12 to 24 tier premise argument, making the case that there is a God. Jesus is the son of God. The Bible is the word of God. And Christianity is the, mo the only reasonable worldview that one could have. So, so all of these books are made available for you. What I've been asked to tell you is that you want to, if you want to purchase them, I think there's only one you can get now. So please don't fight somebody to get up here to get that one. But sign up and uh, pay in advance. Is that right? Pay in advance. He, or somebody will be here to handle all that part afterwards. But sign up. Uh, state which ones you want. My recommendation, invest in your knowledge. Get as many of them as you can. Uh, there probably isn't a... Um, a, um, um, you know, a down payment and then pay as you go kind of situation. But, uh, <laughs> amen. <laughs> you know, but just do your best in the next six weeks to get all you can. And, uh, and you'll be blessed as a result of that. If you have any other questions about these books, I'll hang around for just a minute afterwards. And you can certainly uh, ask those questions. Now, we got to run. We got to run. We got to run. Let me give you this one last disclaimer as we go through our information. Two things. One, if you have questions, we're going to have some cards to come around for you to write your questions out. And I'm going to do my best to have a, a, a response to those questions section for each of our next of, of our classes together. The second thing is, if you're interested in the notes that I'm using, I've 
I've done some work in, our, in the class that I teach on apologetics, but I'm going to take that information and modify it for our time together. So they will be a little bit different. And if you're interested in those notes, let me know. I will email them to you as they are spell checked and all of that. Amen. Uh, so let's go forward. Our purpose for tonight, very simply, is to is to and in this series is to understand the meaning, the importance and relevance of Christian apologetics with a reminder of how one applies the practice, the practice of apologetics towards seekers. Now, I want to heavily emphasize the notion towards seekers, and, and, and I'll let you know in just a minute why. And I want to do that so that we honor the calling of Christ in our stance for the Christian worldview. In order to accomplish this purpose, we're going to begin tonight with defining what we mean by apologetics and then illustrating throughout the scripture how apologetics is done, how God himself not only coined the notion of apologetics, but by nature of what you and I have in our revealed will and word of God, he has already been engaged in the very same things that people fight about now. Should you use apologetics? Should you not use apologetics? Are you, are you interrupting God if you engage in, polit- in apologetics? Or maybe that's more of a human invention. Well, if God invented it, that kind of solves the whole problem altogether. And I think that it is the case that God certainly invented apologetics. Let me leave this with you, though, now. Look at this video that's coming up. I want you to listen to it. I want you to listen to why this study is so important. your opinion. Who is Jesus? See, now, see, now you won't start trouble. It's a myth created by man in order to control society. I don't, I don't consider Jesus my savior or my spiritual leader. He is a spiritual leader and one of the spiritual leaders I learned from. Who is Jesus in your opinion? Who was he? Who was he? Who was he? Was a man. He was a man. Okay. Absolutely. Your opinion. Jesus is, in my opinion, yeah. he's everything around here. He's spiritual, everything, earth, water, fire, everything. Jesus is all that's good, all the things that are positive and affirmative in life. Uh, that's Jesus. I believe he's a higher power in the form of a man. Everyone else walking around, there's not another Jesus. There's just one. So, yeah, I believe he definitely did something. Oh. Yeah, uh, like on, Jesus like, is not a person. He's not a person, okay? Okay. So, do you believe he was a man or just like some higher power or? No, I don't believe in. Don't believe he even no. existed? No. Okay. No. Jesus is um, our savior. Jesus is everything. He's the reason why we live. He's the reason why um, we get to do the things that we do in life. He's my heart and he's what I speak through my poetry, through my work, through my everyday life. That's Jesus. That was something, wasn't it? Um, Just real quick, two people, two people. And watching that, what did that make you think about? What did, how did it make you? I mean, I'm, this is the only time you're going to allow, I will allow some, some aspect of subjectivity. <laughs> but how did it make you feel watching this video? Sad. Sad. What else? Mm, good. I like that. I might have to keep you around. (laughs) How did somebody kill the people on earth with no God? Right, right. No one can do that. Right. There's a lot to it. And what you what you find actually 
first and foremost, even for those that may be believers, because there were a couple who were certainly subscribed to being believers. Wouldn't you argue that from watching that? But, but one of the things you'll note, and this is important for us to, Amer- to, to pay attention to, the American Culture and Faith Institute um, has given, given some information a little while back. This statistic is old, but it just, you can just see how, how it grows even more and more. That, that a number of people who were addressed, number, the American Culture of, and Faith Institute addressed the question of how many Americans have a biblical worldview through a series of nationwide surveys, and they found 10% of American adults currently have a biblical worldview. 10% of American adults. Let me just help you to tease this out a little bit. This is Christendom. This is anyone who would dare name the name of, of Christ. So the, so the numbers actually, when you start pointing them, pointing them further into our fellowship, into the worldview that we subscribe to, then where are we on this radar of 10%? It becomes even more, more, uh, um, uh, more grave for us to understand why this is important. Taking a step further then, if people don't have a biblical worldview, what is the worldview that they're subscribing to? What are the things that we're, where you and I are, are, are pushing against? Someone may be asking right now, what do you mean when you say worldview? I'm talking about the lenses by which you and I understand our origin, our, our, uh, the way we got here, what's wrong with the world, what's going to fix the problem that's wrong with the world, what's happening next, how do I determine right or wrong, what guides my life, what's good and what's bad, what determines that. All of those things make up the picture of, they make up the, the, the bouquet of what you and I would call a biblical worldview. Now, if it is not God who is the foundation and the anchor by which your worldview is crafted, it is something. Let me, get, let me give you a few of them that, that it could be. These are some of the things. You can just take these down and look at, look at some of the ways. And you, you know it from the world that you live in. There are, there are individuals right now who are, their, their worldview is framed by what's called new spirituality. New spirituality is probably one of the most nebulous of these things. This is, this is a very existential and experience-oriented worldview. These are the people that you and I deal with, that everything is a moment. They've got to feel something. Or, or, or truth is based on an experience alone. How do you know you've had, I just, mm, I could just, mm, I feel it, you know, don't you? You know, you, you know what I'm saying? Like, I just, mm, that's how I know. I could just... You get what I mean? Like, yeah. Are y'all, are y'all in here with me? Some of y'all are like, I can't get with that. Me either, but I, I have to explain it to you. <laughs> but that's that, that's that realm. Everything is existential. Truth then, watch this, truth and reality are based on the experience. It's based on the feeling. It's based on whether or not that electricity, that moment took place or not. Then look at the one that's right underneath it, very, very close to it, postmodernism. Postmodernity has gone a step further, and everything is relativized. It is subject to the individual. There's no such thing as an objective truth, a standard that you and I all must fall within. There's no such thing as whatever being true right here in Lubbock, Texas, also being true in post-Texas. Don't ask me why I chose post. But, but there's no such thing as that. What that does, the idea here is that everything is relativized. By the way... Our world, our culture is tremendously affected by postmodernity. That's the reason why now there are no winners in soccer games. Y'all still ain't helping me. Y'all gonna help me over here? Everybody gets a trophy. There are no losers, baby. We're all winners here. Now somebody lost. <laughs> Marxism. Marxism falls within a, you see the, the, the second to last, the third to last word on that sentence, humanism. Yeah. Marxism really is the birth child of humanism. That's the whole concept of leave us alone long enough and we will arrive at truth eventually on our own. That's the concept that, that you and I 
have the right kind of thinking. We have the ability, the mental and the cognitive ability to fix whatever is wrong with the world. And if something's wrong, all it takes for us to fix it is a little bit more information, a little bit more education, and we will eventually arrive at what does correct that. But last time I checked, when you give a thief a little bit more information, a little bit more education, they just become a better thief. If you sit next to one, I can understand why you couldn't say anything. <laughs> and then look at the last one, secularism. Secularism is the notion that you and I are just given over to hedonism. We're given over to the impulse of the flesh. We're given over to the cravings of what we want. We're given over to the things that make up <clears throat> the makeup our mentality, uh, and, 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 and you, you can have whatever you want. You can have it however you want it. Whatever is pleasing to you is what you ought to do. There is no such thing as you being told no. And when you take secularism and you marry it to new spirituality and you marry it to post-modernity, we have a conglomerate. We have a mess of, of humanity on our hands in which Christianity is called to stand up and be different. Yeah. Open your Bibles. First Corinthians chapter. I'm sorry. First Peter chapter three. First Peter chapter three. First Peter chapter three. You know that this this passage, many of you are familiar with it, but this passage serves as a base text. It serves as the foundational text uh, that many much of apologetics has been framed around. I know you're familiar with it. There are a couple of other passages that are just like this one, but this one perhaps is the most the most um, distinct. There in first Peter chapter three and verse number 15, the new American standard says, but sanctify Christ Jesus or Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you yet with gentleness and with reverence. This passage serves as the foundational text by which you and I understand the very word apologetics from the word you read in your English language right here. Verse number 15, be ready to make a defense. You'll note some of you in your, in your Bibles that there's probably a little footnote above the, the, the term defense. And if you look in the center column reference, if you have a reference Bible, you'll probably see the term argument or explanation. That's where we get the term. That's where we get our definition of apologetics. Let me put it up here for you. Some of the classical meanings of the term apologetics, some of the scientific meaning of the term apologetics. It is a branch of theology that offers a rational defense. Look at this for the truthfulness of the divine origin and authority of Christianity. In the classical sense of the term apologetics, it derives its meaning from what, from the Greek word that is, that's a compound one, apologia, which means defense, a judicial term. It's also used to describe a way the way a lawyer deliberately and rationally presents a verbal defense of a particular claim. Taking a step further, the idea of apologetics has both. Uh, an agenda that you and I are, are hoping to appreciate. It has an application for every single disciple and, and it goes a little bit further and it has some expectations, some attention that we need to give when it comes to applying the picture of apologetics. Let me just, let me just stay here for a minute and work on the concept of its agenda. Um, giving you this for this definition as well. In consideration of the term, Remember the context of first Peter chapter three, just in your mind. One of the things you will remember going back to our context, I've given you this snapshot of the worldviews that we're in contention with, but truth be told, when you look at the worldviews that we're in contention with, and you look at the context in which Peter wrote this phrase, sanctify the Lord God always in your heart and be ready always to give an answer to anyone or reason that asks you or anyone that asks you for a reason for the hope within you yet with meekness and with fear. Can I remind you of something? When Peter wrote what he wrote, look how, look how selfish we can become in processing that phrase. We will read that verse and then some of us will go, well, I just need to be ready until somebody asks me. You didn't ask me. So since you didn't ask me, I don't, I don't have to tell you. 
We, we Americanize it. We make it comfortable. We make it convenient. We make it very, very easy. But when he wrote what he wrote, he wrote what he wrote in a time where Christians were being snatched out of their homes. Christians were being treated like, like merchandise. They were being dipped in tar and pitched, lined in Nero's garden, set on fire, many of them being, being cast into arenas where, where wild beasts would pull them apart. They were being, they're, they're just for naming the name of Jesus, people were being assaulted and ridiculed, and you and I don't have enough gumption to respond to somebody who says there isn't truth and, and what do we do well since you don't want to talk about Jesus I, I'm just going to leave you alone no ma'am and no sir yeah. that is not the meaning of apologetics our calling the whole notion of being ready to give every, everyone a reason that asks you let me tell you how they ask they're not going to ask you by coming to tap you on the shoulder they're asking you go back to that first century group that first century group where Christians were still willing to die for their faith the queerest was, I don't understand why these folks still dying on behalf of this Jesus fellow. If it was me, I would have tapped out and said, I don't know Jesus. The confusion was, how do you maintain your hold on honoring God while everything around you is arguing the opposite thing? Bring it to the 21st century then. Our posture ought to be that we are looking. To have Jesus, look at the phrase itself, so separated in your heart that nothing can remove the fact that there is a God. Jesus is the son of God. The Bible is the word of God and Christianity is the worldview of God. Nothing can separate that. And that's the anchor. That's what's set apart in your mind. What you and I then are, we are read, We are always ready to articulate that. I'm always ready to talk about that. I'm always ready to live out that. I stay prepared to make my defense in that. That's what Peter's after. And in like fashion, we're doing the exact same thing in our, in our articulation of apologetics. Let me give you a couple of more definitions. Cornelius Van Til, uh, one of the most renowned presuppositionalists, says about apologetics, it is the vindication of the Christian philosophy of life against various forms of non-Christian philosophy of life. Gardner says that apologetics is the rational defense of Christianity. It gives positive reasons for belief in God, Christ, and the Bible while removing obstacles up to faith by answering false objections. There's another thinker. <laughs> and he says about apologetics. Christian apologetics is the systematic engagement of counter worldviews that answers objections, offers an account for the faith, and challenges competing worldviews in a whimsical and relational manner. <laughs> I like his definition, whoever this guy is. <laughs> now, now watch what we're arguing, watch what we're maintaining. We're maintaining, when you put all of those together, that there are some things, there's, there's an agenda to Christianity, there's an agenda to, to, to Christian apologetics that we have to all be mindful of. I don't have time to go back and read these to you, but I do want to at least let you know this. The notion of answering objectives, the notion of offering an account for the faith, the notion of challenging weaker worldviews has been employed by, by disciples for centuries now. That there in, the, in, the, in the 150 AD, you had the first line of Christian apologists, men like, like uh, Justin Martyr, men like Tertullian, men like Clement of Alexandria. These individuals were known for standing to defend the accusations of false information against Christianity. Can I let you in on something? Part of the agenda of you and I as disciples who would engage in apologetics, a large part of it is simply removing false accusations about Christianity. There are a number of people who will herald things at you. 
Oh, y'all Christians. See, you know, I can't be a Christian because uh, all of y'all do everything about Christianity. You got to keep too many laws. Which ones you talking about? Well, I don't know. I just heard you had to keep a bunch of laws. Well, that, that's that's just not true. Some of the things that we hear, the, the things that people come up with, they are at false accusations about our worldview that a big part of your apologetic, a big part of your defense is simply removing the debris that's a false narrative about Christianity so that people can finally see the truth of who God is, who Jesus is, what the Bible actually says, and why Christianity is important. Let me go a step further. When you and I can appreciate this definition, this is why I like this definition of this fellow right here. Again, I don't... (laughs) Good dude, good dude, good dude. Anyway... The reason why that definition is important is because watch what it does. If you, can, if, you can, if you can see the significance of what we're arguing here, these efforts then place the disciple of Christ on the offense. We're on the offense. There is a part of the term. The term itself, make a defense. And we hear that, and it almost, it almost grabs the posture that you're standing back and you're waiting for the fight to come. But, but, but remember that defense is simply you removing the false narrative about Christianity. The offense is you taking and offering a counterclaim about Christianity. That's the evangelistic side of what we do. We take what we know to be true. Question, show of hands. Does Jesus excite any of you? (laughs) Two or three of us? Lord of mercy. That's that's part of the problem right there. (laughs) If you can get excited about Jesus, I'm just going to put it on this way. If you can get excited about Jesus, you have a narrative. You have a defense. You have an account. You have a, 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 a counter narrative you can offer on behalf of Christ. Let me go a step further. How does all of this work together? In uh, Lord of mercy, I got to hurry. Um, what does a good apologetic look like then? Let me, let me just share this with you. The agenda of apologetics then is to defend the truth of the Christian worldview. It is to answer false claims. It is to challenge faulty worldviews. And it is to offer a superior belief. That's the agenda. When you and I think in terms of engaging in apologetics, your agenda is not to win an argument. Hello? Hello? This is not you fussing. This is not you having more Bible or more sophistry in your speech. It's not a battle of erudition. This is this is really you saying, you know what? I I, I just want to hold on to the right way to see Christianity. And I think right now you're seeing it wrong. This is you saying what you've what you've described Jesus and God. Those things just aren't true. How you've looked at what Christianity requires of you is not the case. The, the, the picture you have of God being this big boogeyman, that's not the God I serve. I serve a God who's all loving, who's gracious, who's amazing. Yes, he does bring judgment, but he loves you so much that that judgment is minuscule in comparison to his love. <laughs> Apologetics has an agenda that's interested in sharing those things. But not only does it have an agenda that's interested in sharing those things, that there is an application that every disciple has to embrace. And I'm going to give you a little bit more of this definition. The, the, the application that every single disciple, that's all of us in here who claim to be disciples of Christ. Our application is to embrace the calling to be ready. Go back to 1 Peter 3 again. Be ready. Say it so I know you got it. Be what? Be ready. Ah, and if you're ready, then the, the, the idea of being ready is modified by the, the phrase that comes after it. Be ready always, yeah. always. Why? Because you never have any idea when a false agenda, a false narrative, a, 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 a heretical truth that attacks Christianity will present itself. Can I let you in on something? That takes place when you watch television, listen to the radio, and even hear some of your Christian friends on a regular basis. Thomas, what are you saying? I'm saying the attack against the Christian worldview takes place in many forms, not just your agnostic or atheist friend. The attack takes place even in the subtleties of you watching television programs or listening to music or even hearing Christians make statements like, what's your horoscope say today? 
Some of y'all look down right there. Yeah, I'm talking to you. <laughs> that is not of God. That is not of the Christian worldview. So we have to embrace the calling to be ready. But then not only that, number two, in our application as disciples, we need to be ready to articulate what we believe and why we believe it. Going back to our earlier uh, information, part of the Christian problem, part of the, the, the dilemma in the Christian worldview is that there are so many individuals who come to the place where the Christians meet who assemble to do things that Christians do, who carry the book that Christians carry, who sing songs that Christians sing, but really know nothing about the God they worship. I.e., they have a bankrupt Christian worldview. When it comes to asking simple questions, like define the nature of your God, many of us would be stuck at John 3.16. He's a loving God. God so loved the world. Great. And what else? What else would characterize your God to argue the case that he is the agent behind this entire universe? What in your Bible would describe that God as such? What in your Bible would describe God as being the foundation and the source and the grounds by which all morality springs through? From your Bible, articulate that. And we find ourselves in deficit Largely because we are not competent in the book that makes all the difference to our worldview. Let me go a step further. I want to give you some things that good apologetics is built on. Good apologetics. And, I, and I, I'm sorry if, I, if I'm racing, but I'm trying my best to get um, this information to you on today. <clears throat> and I want, to, I want to leave you with one last thought. Good apologetics, though. Good apologetics <coughs> includes... A couple of things. I've given you this already. I'm just going to throw it up here and go, go over them real quick. <clears throat> it includes the attention that you and I must have. And this is the last point I was just on. The deficit. What, what's the deficit, Thomas? The tremendous ignorance about the Bible. Yeah. It includes our attention to the notion of defense. Ownership of the Christian worldview and then therefore application of that Christian worldview. I, I want to challenge you as you go throughout the rest of the week and, and especially as you circle back around in these next seven days that you, you actually pay attention to the things that are counterintuitive to Christianity. What are some of these things? What are some of the things that we let seep in? Some of the things that some of the rhetoric that we hear that actually goes against the notion of who God is and what you're supposed to believe. All those things are attacks against Christianity, of which you and I need to be more attentive to. What about, what about the ability? You and I have to be willing to dismiss these false notions. And then finally, the last part, to declare the truth about what we believe. But let me make another, another echo right back to the major point. You can't declare what you don't know. You can't make a case for what you have not taken time to study. And that's part of the reason why we're doing what we're doing in this in this class. I've got just a few minutes. I got to move on. I'm sorry. Just hold it to the end. I promise you we'll, we'll make some time. I want to I want to skip some slides here. So you're about to see some stuff that I'm not going to cover, but pretend you don't see it. Can you <laughs> pretend? Keep pretending. Keep pretending. Take a picture real quick. Hurry, hurry, hurry. OK, keep pretending. Keep pretending. This was going to be a good one. I, I might give it to you next week, but keep pretending. Keep pretending. Y'all still pretending? No. You've given up pretending? No. Okay. This is what I said. I don't know. Let me share this. Let me share this last part with you. What we're going to work through is making the same claim the scripture makes. This is going to be our objective. This is going to be the layout that we're going to, we're going to work to articulate. My goal is to give you some of, I believe, the principles that will help to make that case, to help make the defense. First and foremost, God exists. Now, now how do we know that? We're going to make a case and we're going to look at some of the responses that are there. What do you mean by some of the responses that are there? We're going to argue that God is responsible for everything that is. We're going to argue that the world came into existence because God did it, not because of happenstance, not because of chance, not because of some freak force that brought it all together. Question, where did the freak force come from? Got to ask those questions. 
God brought everything that is into existence. So since God exists, that explains our origin. That explains our universe. That also explains human history then. We are not the product of ooze. We're not random chance. We're not, we're not humanity 5.0. We are God's, God's art, God's, God's primary agent. We, we are God's um, uh, a crowning achievement of creation made in the image of God. You don't have to say amen. I'll say amen myself. Amen, Thomas. Amen. God made in the image of God and, and, and God loved us. He loved us so much. That he knew that some of y'all would mess it up. I mean, some of us would mess it up. (laughs) And God knows the human condition. He knows why we're in the problem that we're in. But he also, number six, or number five, gives the solution to our problem. And the solution to the human problem is realized in none other than who? Say it like you believe it. None other than who? Now, if in fact there is a Jesus, because you heard the lady, I'm not too sure that I even believe that there was a Jesus. I don't got the accent down, but y'all, I got the attitude down. I don't know if there was a, some of the people in the video made you want to go, stop that. Amen. (laughs) We'll look at the history. We'll look and see whether, is there, was there a Jesus? I mean, really? Some of y'all, I think you just believe in just because you believe. Is there, do you know? Do you have evidence that there was a Jesus? Is there anything that would validate what you claim to believe? Why do you get up and go to church on Sunday? Why do you take communion? Why do you keep getting these unleavened bread that don't even taste good and Welch's grapefruit? Why do you do it? Why do you give? Why do you serve? Why don't you knock the fire out of your coworker when they cuss you out? Why are you staying in your marriage? Why are you trying to be morally upright? Why do you serve? Why do you go the extra mile? Why do you have hope that defies reality? It makes no sense. Why do you do that? Well, well, from the Christian worldview, it's because we believe that he is not just that he was, but that he is. We're going to make that case. And since he does exist, we'll be able to argue even in an even more robust manner that the Bible is the word of God. We'll be able to explain that Christianity is not a way. It's not something that you ought to be, not something that you could be. Christianity is it. Then finally, we'll be able to argue in a deep and profound way the hope that we have in living right now and the hope that lets us know there's more to this life. The best is yet to come. I'm sorry, but Joel Osteen is wrong. Your best life is not now. Your best life is yet to come. What that would look like real quickly is something like this. We're going to begin. Uh Uh-oh, I'm letting the cat out the bag. Come on, go back in the bag, cat. We're going to begin by by making a case for truth. We can't have an objective conversation. We're going to build on that case by, by articulating the cosmological argument. Then the teleological argument, the argument for our existence, the universe is, the argument for the design of the universe, the argument for the human condition, the answer in King Jesus, the, the validity of the Bible being the word of God, and then finally, the, the, to put a bow on top of it, arguing the Christian worldview. This will be our progression as we move through our time. My time is up right now. God bless you. and Thank you for your attention.